Thanks so much for having us here. Um, as Lori mentioned, uh, Smithers was my hometown for um, most of my life until I met my wife. And you'll do crazy things for love, even move to the Dawson Creek region, um, which is beautiful and I've grown to love it. But uh, I went there very unwillingly uh, because the community along Highway 16 is so strong in the things that I feel are important. Um, one of them being community. You know, we care about each other. We have these types of events where we talk about the issues that are facing us in a productive way and we don't protest and throw fits. We're like, hey, how can we make this better? And um, so for my wife and I, we moved out there. We started working, um, as you do, and we made some values-driven decisions around the birth of our children. And we said, you know, we want to be here for them and present. How can we do this? And that came down to food security and access to high-quality nutrition. You want to feed your kids well. It's expensive to do. And my wife came with 18 horses when we got married. So we had some land kicking around. <laughs> um, and, and that was the beginning of the thing. I always tell people, be careful when you get chickens because they're a gateway drug to farming. And you will end up doing more and more. Um, and you'll be happy doing it, which is, I guess, the, under, the underlying story there. In 2016, we started looking at ways to reduce our reliance on outside work uh, so that we could spend more days of the week at home with our kids because um, time is finite and kids grow fast. And I think as soon as you have one, you know what this is all about. Um, we, in this search, came across some places where food was being wasted out of uh, restaurants and out of uh, local food banks when they're unable to give the food away. Um, there was actually a really strange scenario where we came across a company that tests peanut butter, um, which I didn't know was a thing, but what they're supposed to do is take one scoop of peanut butter out of every uh, 2,000th jar in the batches and then taste it and then take a second scoop and put it in for analysis. And then they put the lid back on and throw the peanut butter away. Um, this is a company in Washington State that does that. And they end up throwing out around, you know, two or 3,000 jars of peanut butter a week with two scoops out of it. So this uh, got us thinking about food waste in our community. There's also a documentary called Just Eat It that was filmed in Vancouver where they lived for a calendar year on food that they found in dumpsters. And we approached our local grocery store and said, we have this farm, we would like to work with you, we think there could be a positive partnership there. And uh, they said, yeah, 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 sounds great, um, but we're gonna have to say no. And uh, that was not a very satisfactory answer. And because Dawson has a small town element, we were able to have a conversation with the manager behind the scenes about why he had to say no. There's liability reasons, there's litigation region, there's brand damage potential, there's infrastructure loss and damage, there's, there's a whole constellation of things that they see from a, that we don't see as farms. Um, we just kind of roll with what happens. You wake up and the fences are broken, you fix them. Uh, animals are out, you put them back in. Uh, stores are big and have legal teams. And They helped us build a system that worked. Then Safeway wanted to work with us, and then the Safeway on either side wanted to work with us, and a few months later we were talking to Save On Foods. And they have been tremendous partners in pushing us to take this style of food diversion where we take literally 100% of the wasted food out of a store. There is nothing left, not packaged, not unpackaged, not organic, not inorganic. Uh, in their waste stream, they have, in their compactor, you'll find styrofoam, you'll find contaminated plastics that are unrecyclable, and you, in some municipalities, you'll find waxed cardboard. And they have encouraged us and embraced the program at a top-down level, and now we work from the Manitoba-Saskatchewan border to Victoria, BC, and as far north as Whitehorse this summer with Save On Foods to build these co cooperative systems um, with local farm communities and the grocers. Um, it's been a really interesting journey. Bruce and I talked a lot at different things. Um, we go around and talk to stores when they're opening. Bruce will talk about the Save on Food side and what we'd like to do is open it up to some questions, really. Uh, there's so many interest groups in this room. There's a lot of farmers. I know a lot of faces here from the Smithers and uh, Kitimat and Terrace fall fairs and the time that I spent here. Um, we talked to farming, we talked to um, policy and regional districts, our message to regional districts is the capacity exists in your community to divert food waste in this way.
already. You don't need big infrastructure projects and you don't need a grant. We can do it cheaper than garbage. We can do it tomorrow and we can do it in a way that benefits everybody. Um, that has been our rollout plan everywhere and so far it's successful. Um, presumably at some point we'll find a region that doesn't work but hasn't happened yet. I'll hand it over to Bruce, then we'll open it up to you guys. Um, we can talk more about how we work as Loop, we can talk more about how Save On views the world. They're a very cool organization that actually does what they say they're going to do. Um, we contract to five grocery chains in Canada currently and I can tell you that's not always the case. <laughs> not to speak ill of anyone specifically, but we do find a lot of talk and not a lot of action. Um, Save On Foods made the decision to change the way they throw out food at 170 locations at that time in a 45 minute meeting and they called the vote in the meeting. Like we went from talking about it to doing it the next week. Um, so bravo to you, Bruce. Hand it off to you. Um, I'm happy to, yeah. So this is a, a great question that I kind of skipped over in the part where, uh, so I have a small farm which has pigs and chickens and sheep and goats and cows. And what we found is that all of the food waste from the grocery stores is good calories for our animals if we make uh, appropriate connections. Originally, we were not permitted to feed people. Um, the, about the second load we got, we were looking at it and we're like, ooh, um, probably half of this stuff could go to a, go to a food bank, but we had to sign a pretty extensive legal contract that said we couldn't do that. Save on Foods is the only brand we work with that has said we would like you to feed people. We would like you to include the local charity partners in access to this food without obligation to take things that are not suitable for you or maybe not beneficial. Because um, we know that needs fluctuate. You know, sometimes there's big food insecurity challenges. Weather's cold, work is hard, it's a bad winter. Um, even for farmers, if you have a bad summer where it's, uh, you don't get the crop volume off that you expect, you're in a low cash flow environment, uh, you now actually have low food availability for yourself, your root cellar is not as full as it could be, and Savon has allowed us to partner with allowing access to this food to feed people first, and so that, that inverted pyramid that you saw is exactly what we work down. The first goal is to provide the data to the stores to help them waste less. So when we see anomalies in our data, we provide analytics back to the store to say, um, across your region, we noticed an 11% jump in uh, produce shrinkage for these two days. You might want to look at the warehouse level or the ordering or something, something went off. Um, and at a store level, we'll talk to them about patterns so that they can train and meet the minimum possible shrinkage, um, which helps them save money in another way. And then we'll feed people. If we can't feed people, we'll feed the animals that feed people. If you can't feed those, you should feed the animals that provide support and companionship. If you can't do that, you should produce bioenergy. Can't do that, composting is a good option. Um, and finally, it should go to incineration and lastly to landfill. Well, never to landfill is our line. And as an organization, we divert 98.2% of the food to the top two. So it goes to people and animals. Yeah, so Loop has become, a, it was, I was the, uh, the original farm interested in this and as soon as we had a grocery store that said yes, it was quite obvious that my farm couldn't consume everything. So we built a coalition of farms in town that worked together to use the food and as we added stores, we added farms. So I'm, I'm the face of about a thousand farms in Western Canada that are doing this and we all work together to make it happen. Um, we're a social enterprise because we weren't allowed to be a nonprofit for legal reasons. Um, we have to buy pretty expensive insurance and we have to be able to be sued, for instance, <laughs> uh, to get the contracts. So uh, we're fully willing to be sued. We protect the farms, we protect the stores, and if somebody goes down for this, it's us. But man, what a way to go down. Like, um, we're, we're willing to die on that cross, I guess. Um, Bruce will talk about the uh, Save on Foods story and how they've got, come to here, and then we'll open it up to more questions for either of us, I guess. And, I, and I'm sure there's lots of questions. Thanks, James. Um, so this, our, our relationship with, uh, with James and uh, Loop Resources started um, 14 months ago in Victoria. We ran what was called a pilot for two stores, which eventually worked its way into uh, 50, 55, 56 now. And I apologize to Richard because we should have actually brought out uh, Andrew from Prince Rupert and 
and John from Kitimat because they're all going to be rolled into this program where it's going to be zero food waste for the region. So it's pretty significant what we've done. In, um, in a span of, well, span of 14 months, we've done a cultural shift for Save on Foods and where it's now going to be in 100% of our stores. We recognize what we, what we need to do and how we need to do it. And like through working with Loop, and we've got a couple other partners in a couple different areas, we realize that composting or throwing out our food waste is not the right option. We want to go to the highest end use. So human consumption first, animal feed, and then bio, and then as James said, down to compost and never landfill. So we've, uh, Daryl made an announcement, Daryl Jones made an announcement a couple weeks ago in Kelowna, committing the company to taking care of this, doing, going forward with this process. And uh, at uh, every, every year at uh, the manager's meeting for Save On Foods, all the managers get together. At the end of the meeting, Jimmy Patterson, the owner of Save On Foods, said to take care of the environment. And this is how we're going to do it. OK, so um, questions from the regional district side or the farm side or um, let's pick up the stragglers from the last little bit and then see what we can talk to. Yeah. Just, I'll restate the question if you want. Yes. Yep. So when we're working with a farm, one of the things we want to talk about is the impact of the food on your farm. Um, there's a lot of good calories in it. It's good for your animals and the animal health. Um, and you will compost the things that are not suitable for your feed chain. Um, we select the farms based on a criteria that we've found over time to work the best. You need to have dogs, for instance. Uh, there's a lot of meat that's available. Dogs do very well on meat. Um, sheep, for the, <laughs> on the other hand, shouldn't have meat. Um, also, composting large quantities of meat is not a great idea from an environmental and pest attractant standpoint, and it's also difficult to do. It can be done, but it's not something that we would want to assume farms do out of the gate. So to the question of pesticides, um, the best thing you can do with a chemical, most chemicals, some of them are very stable, like grazon has been talked about already. Grazon in your compost is a terrible thing for broadleafs. When you compost many pesticides, they break down through the cycle of bio-intensive activity in the soil. It takes time, and so we want to know that this is a good fit with your farm management plan. Um, our compost rates are about 1.8% across the board, so it's, it's a fairly low concentration of organics. If you're producing all of your food on your farm and you are an organic farm, that even that percentage might not be suitable to you. Most of our farms are homesteads, family farms, and uh, ethical farms that are raising food and trying to take their load off the land. They're going to say, we as a family want to raise what we eat, or we as an intentional community want to raise what we eat. And so th that's an ideal relationship for us. Um, we can't make the pesticides go away, but we can do good things with them. Um, so for, for me and my farm, we made the decision to compost uh, things that we're worried about. Uh, we compost the banana peels if the goats don't eat them. Um, we've done some testing to see check for residuals. Our residual rates currently are so low that they don't measure in the compost, um, but our compost rate's really low, so I, I don't want to paint this as too rosy a picture because the reality is everything gets eaten out on my place. I don't have compost like in any measurable capacity beyond my all my waste hay and manure. And, but, but regular farm compost, compost I got lots. But um, most of this is going as energy to your animals and that's where the benefit lies. Yes. Yes, connecting to local farms. Yep. Um, and how do you plan to connect or network with local farms? How does your, your organization get So So um, we should have this on the, on the slide, but if you go to facebook.com slash loop resource, 
Uh, on the back table, I stealthily seeded some of my cards out there. They also have the website on it and the Facebook page. There's a sign-up link. We've, because I was local to this region, we've been networking with Lori and other local farmers um, to, in case Savon made this decision, which we're really pleased they have. Um, we take referrals, we take, we're basically we're, we're going to encourage farms to reach out and tell us how we can help them. Um, we only work with local farms, we don't do pump outs, we don't, we're not going to throw it on a truck and take it somewhere else. Everything we do is built around local sustainable infrastructure that currently exists, um, which is, yeah. Is there any size requirement or like capacity requirement for farms to have to accept the waste? Yes and no. Uh, we as an organization never say no. <laughs> so I'll put, well, I shouldn't say that. There are scenarios we would say no under that we've never had to exercise. Um, if you had an incredibly uh, unsustainable farm operation and basically were an eyesore and a drag on your community, we wouldn't want to be associated with that. But in, if you come to us and say, I have, so a great example is Airdrie West. So in Airdrie, uh, Save on Foods has two stores, and in the Airdrie West store, the Backyard Chicken Association of Airdrie came to us. Uh, it's a pilot project that they run where people are allowed eight hens uh, each, which is a very small number, and can eat not that much food. And they said, we would like to access this food because it makes better eggs. And we said, yes, it does. Um, I'm concerned about the number of chickens you have because my average load size is between 200 and 600 kilograms a day. Um, which is going to last you basically all year. And they formed a coalition and said, all of us together, all 20 pilot project backyard chicken farms, would like to take one day a week out of your schedule. And so we built an into our scheduling application the flexibility to include coalition farms with multiple representatives so that we can provide access to even the smallest farms and help them grow. Um, our goal is to grow with our farms and not to push you to grow. I, you know, if your farm can carry six pigs and 40 chickens comfortably in the accommodations that you have and the pasture that you have to rotate through, it's not my business to require you to keep any more. Um, and, and that would be an ideal farm for me. Uh, three to 10 pigs, 20 to 200 chickens, and three large dogs. If you have that and you come to me, I'm very confident you can be a, a, a great partner. If you have one of those elements, I'll try and find the other two for you. And if you have none of those elements and just want to be involved, we'll still find a way to help include you in the conversation. Prince Rupert, Prince Rupert is a great example of this. Um, Prince Rupert is a fantastic farming community. <laughs> Not. Um, and we have a Save on Foods there. We love Prince Rupert and there's lots of potential for farming in small select areas that don't involve large tractors and things, you know. The land is unique in the Rupert area. So in Port Edward, there's some flat land that you might be able to farm on. I know there are some livestock in tiny pockets. We now have a mandate from Save on Foods to divert 100% of their food waste to the hierarchy. Um, there is charity need there. We'll be looking for partners along the corridor. Um, we also try and pair with farms that already do work in these areas. A lot of farms, we, we I'm as guilty as, this, as anyone, but uh, I work to farm and all the money I make off the farm goes to buy things on the farm like new fences and new exotic colors of chickens that my wife likes. And um, <laughs> My wife is wonderful. She, uh, she puts up with all of this. <laughs> I do, I do joke that I have Noah's Ark, though, because I never know what I'm going to come home to. And, uh, and at one point, we did have everything but a cow, and I hear that might be happening while I'm away, so <laughs> um, wish me luck. If you know anyone in the Rupert Corridor between Terrace and Prince Rupert that works in Prince Rupert, even if it's very periodically, we will work with the schedule of that farm. We don't want to make you drive for food, but if you're already there for a meeting once a month or if you're there for work, couple times a week. This is an excellent relational um, model that can be built around food waste. We're already using logistics that exist in the community, trips that are being planned, and we're using food that already exists as waste to supply needs that already exist to produce local food. Yes? Like from a, a fish plant? There's, there's a bunch of options there. That's not one that we've had to handle 
in a, in a, most of our work has ended up being with retail groceries. So they're typically not cleaning the fish there. But a friend of mine runs a, a small off-grid homestead that uh, he's, he's past Whitehorse almost into Alaska, basically. And with all the fish offal, he runs a biodigester on his farm. It's, it's tremendously rich in proteins and nitrogens. It breaks down into natural gas very quickly. And he runs his stove off of natural gas that's biodigested from offal. Um, he runs it, it's called a biodigester. So it's a capsule where you anaerobically decompose things, yeah. Yes. Uh, we're from Kitimat, we're really excited about this. Uh, just wondering, our other grocery store is No Frills. Have you established a relationship with them? Okay, so plug your ears, Bruce. <laughs> um, we try. We try really hard to. Uh, yeah, uh, we try really hard to respect the partners that are working with us without throwing uh, anybody under the bus. Um, so uh, No Frills is Loblaws. Loblaws Canada is the largest grocer in Canada. We we have an agreement in principle with them as of uh, about ten days ago. Um, we have none of their stores started, and we do not have a contract with them, and we do not have final legal approval. So um, I might be able to better answer that question in about a month when they figure out what they're doing. But yes, we work with Sobeys, Safeway Co-op, and Save on Foods in m various areas. Um, Save on Foods has been far and away the, the best partner. It took us six months to start the first Safeway. And since we began t conversations with Bruce 14 months ago, uh, Save on Foods has opened 54 or 55 stores into this program, and Safeway has not figured out which one they want to do next. So we actually run the same number of Safeways we ran before we started with Save on Foods, and now Save on Foods does 10 times the stores. I always thought that we were um, four to five years ahead of the game going through Loop. But I understand that uh, in talking to Jam, that the now <laughs> that the competition is hot on our heels because we are we are setting the bar. Save on Foods has always been we like we've never bragged like in the five years that I've worked there. Our culture has always been we don't brag about what we're doing, but I think we have to brag about what we're doing now because this is I think pretty symbolic, yeah. and uh, it's it's pretty epic for what we're what we've undertaken. I want to thank you all for the questions. We were going to be here for a bit. Um, Can I do a follow-up? Sure. Just, just on Save On, just wanted to say uh, we do shop there. We love Save On Foods. Um, some other wish list items related to this, though, are rolling out a tear weight uh, platform so that people who don't want to use bags but do want to buy bulk, uh, it would be really nice to see that in your stores, as well as a lot less pla pas plastic packaging on the produce and uh, a broader range of organic yes, food. I, <laughs> I, I spend a lot of money in your store and <laughs> would like to see those things. Yeah. Thanks so much. We'll be around for questions in the breaks. Cards are at the back if we miss you somehow. Um, thank you for your time and for hosting us in Terrace. Thank you. Thank you.